spending some time in the desert, so I'm gonna got my water here, I'm ready to go. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever gone to an amusement park. And somebody's told you about this awesome ride that you need to go on. So you're like, eh, I don't know, it sounds like maybe a little too much for me. But everyone else is going, so you get over there, and you get in line, and you're excited. But then you start hearing the people like going on the loops and going around the corners, and they're screaming and yelling. You're like, yeah, I don't know, but you don't want to make a big scene. So you get on, and you get strapped in, and you're like equally like so excited to do this because you saw all the people coming off, and they were all still alive, and they got smiles on their faces. Um, but you're also terrified. And you get in there, and you strap yourself in, and you're ready to go. That's exactly how I feel right now. I am, equally, I am equally excited and terrified to be up here. And if you knew I was talking tonight, and you still came, seriously, thank you. Um, and I don't know how many of you, when I was in school, um, Field trips were the best because teachers could tell you this stuff all day long, and it didn't really sink in. But if you were to go visit a place, a museum, or Washington, D.C., all of a sudden this stuff comes to life. And, it, and you get excited about it, and you go back and you learn more in a day than you probably did in six months in history class, right? So kind of in a little different sense, we get to see the Bible come alive tonight. And I'm not going to say that it's a perfectly accurate depiction of what happened, but compared to a lot of the movies lately that have been made about the Bible, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys were here two weeks ago, but David, someone, a pastor guy, was here, um, and he shared about Joseph and how God used these amazing circumstances to bring this tiny little nation of the Israelites to Egypt so he could take care of them and feed them and protect them. And there were 70 of them. And he brought them and they lived in a land in the middle of Egypt called Goshen. 400 years later, conservatively there's a million of them. A nation within a nation. Enslaved. Doing the Pharaoh's work. Whether it's building dance floors, you'll get that later, or whatever whatever Pharaoh needed, um, they, were the, they were the ones who did the work. And they were crying out to God, and God heard them. And it was time that they get their independence and they go to the promised land that God had promised them centuries and centuries before. So he trained a man called Moses in Pharaoh's palace for 40 years. Then he took him out to the desert for 40 years more to train him. And he appeared to him in a burning bush. And when Moses complained that he wasn't the man for the job, God gave him his brother Aaron to help him. And God gave him these crazy signs and wonders and plagues so that, he could, so that they could represent him before Pharaoh. To convince Pharaoh that he was the one and only true living God. And that's where we pick up our story tonight. Moses and Aaron are in the desert. They're about ready to approach a pharaoh that has anything and everything at his fingertips that you could ever want. He was convinced that he was a god. Things were going to change drastically. Some of the signs that Moses and Aaron were given was to turn water into blood. Um, Aaron's staff could turn into a snake. And Moses' hand would be leprous, diseased. And when he put it back in his cloak, it was full of heels. So they came and they showed the elders of Israel and Pharaoh those signs. And Pharaoh was completely unmoved. In fact, he said, I do not know this God, and I will not let you go. Leave. So the first of ten plagues started. Moses one morning turned the blood of the Nile and all the drinking water in Egypt into blood. They had to dig new wells by the side of the Nile to be able to drink. <coughs> then frogs came. Heaps and heaps of frogs afterwards, rotting, 
corpses of frogs in the island. And then gnats. And then flies. And starting with the flies, the plagues were even, the plagues did not affect the Hebrews anymore, only the Egyptians. And at that point, Pharaoh's like, okay, maybe there's something to this. And he says, you can go worship your God, but just stay in our land and come back soon. And Moses and Aaron are like, no, no deal. So the plagues kept coming. Livestock, a disease on the livestock, could have killed most of the livestock in Egypt. And Pharaoh had his guys go and investigate to see if any of the livestock from the Israelites had died, and it did not. And then boils, sores all over all the Egyptians. And then hail. And at this point, Pharaoh said, okay, the Lord's right, and I'm wrong. I'll let you go. But as soon as the hail stopped, he changed his mind. And then locusts that came and ate everything the hail didn't destroy. And he's like, okay, I've sinned. I'll let you go, but just take the men. Just men can go, and that's cool, and then you can come back. And once again, Moses and Aaron said, that's not God's deal. God's deal. And then darkness for three days. Darkness, if they say, could be felt. For three days, Pharaoh had to think about it. And he still refused to let him go. So God sent the last plague, the plague of death. Which unless you killed a one-year-old lamb and painted the blood on your doorpost, he would come and kill the firstborn in your house. And there wasn't a house in all of Egypt that there wasn't somebody dead. And Pharaoh finally relented and said, you can go. Go. Go and never come back. That lasted a few days and he changed his mind. If you can believe that, he hadn't had enough. He's like, what have we done? We let all our slaves go. Who's going to build what we need built? So he chased them. He chased them through the desert to the Red Sea. But the Hebrews had God in the form of a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night who was leading them through the wilderness and who stood guard and protected them as Moses parted the Red Sea and they escaped through the Red Sea. And you all know the story. When Pharaoh tried to do the same, his army was wiped out. And that's Pharaoh's story. When I first read this story a few months ago, we were going through Exodus in the high school group. And I'm like, you read the story and you're like, what a yahoo that Pharaoh is, right? <laughs> what a dipstick, what a blockhead, whatever word that you want to use. But God really spoke to me and he said, you know, Larry, there's some Pharaoh in you. Look at these problems, look at these failures that Pharaoh had. And then look at yourself. They're there. Hopefully not as much as they were 10, 20, 30 years ago, but they're there. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to talk about three failures that I saw in Pharaoh that I really saw in myself. And then we're going to watch it play out. How did it play out for Pharaoh? And then we'll talk about three fixes. Three ways that maybe um, we can come to, combat this thing so we don't fail the same way. The first thing you heard in my story. Pharaoh had a shallow, shallow sorrow, didn't he? He was sorry, but he was only sorry as far as his own personal suffering loss. Just for what he was losing in health and wealth and his reputation. He was sorry that his livelihood and his legacy and those loyal to him were, were turning on him. And in much the same way, a lot of times, when I do something that brings consequences, when I sin, I'm really slow to be sorry about what I've done. I'm sorry about the fact that, that people can see that I messed up. Or I'm sorry about the consequences that it's brought to me. A shallow, shallow sorrow, like if this is the surface, it goes to here sometimes. In your head, you know it. You're not happy with the outcome. Once in a while, like Pharaoh, it went to here. But as soon as things got better, I wasn't sorry anymore. A couple of things that I think contribute to this is an arrogance concerning our importance in the place in the universe. We think without God, we are somebody and we know something. Bad mistake. 
Are we a big deal? Yeah, but we're only a big deal because of God and his love for us and that he creates us. In and of ourselves, we're fair. The second thing that contributes to a shallow sorrow is that we deny sin. It's important. Um, and the severity of sin. I think, um, <laughs> this is terrible, but sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had this, but you see this little zit on your face. You're like, okay, I need to get rid of that before it becomes something big. And you squeeze it. And like this big honking long thing comes out. You're like, no way! How did that ever fit in this? And that's the way that sin is. There is way more under the surface. There is way more going on than just what we see a lot of times. And a lot of times we'll never know. We'll never know the extent of what that sin was. I wrote a little quote on here. It says, our reverence to God is seen in our attitude towards sin. Or you could say, your lack of reverence to God is seen in our attitude towards sin. Towards sin. So he had a shallow sorrow. He also had a very misguided motivation. He was totally motivated by self-satisfaction self-preservation and self-glorification, making much of himself. Once again, many times I'm not better. If I'm making a decision, I might ask myself things like, what's in this for me? Or how am I going to benefit? Misguided motivation. Yourself. Myself. A couple things that contribute to this. An ignorance of God's ways. I put it on here both revealed and Unrevealed, but really it's revealed and being revealed. An ignorance of God's ways that are written in the Word of God, and an ignorance of God's ways, things that He's doing right now, instant among all of us. Another thing that contributes to misguided motivation is we are busy making our own. Busy making our own plans. When we do these things, it's not a matter of if. But when disaster was struck. I have the privilege of working with Lando, and he may or may not look a lot like Pharaoh. And uh, he was raised in Venezuela until he was in middle school. So there's still words and phrases that he doesn't quite get, and I'll say things and he'll like, be like, wait, what exactly does that mean? Or explain that to me. So one day he spilled a bunch of paint all over me. And later he told me how that happened, and I said, well, that was kind of a recipe. And he thought that was awesome. He's like, okay, I'm going to try to use that. So we'd be driving around and seeing things happening, like maybe a motorcycle or like cutting in and out of cars real quick. And he'd say, that's a recipe for disaster. And he'd get a smirk on his face. Like, you never used it like that. <laughs> okay, it's not a matter of if it's plain. The sin, any sin, as small as you think it is, Giving God excuses and leftovers is risky, risky business. So we got a shallow sorrow, we have a misguided motivation. And the last failure that I saw in Pharaoh and myself was he was cutting dangerous deals. Wasn't he? He was bargaining with God. He was trying to set the terms with God. He thought he could outlast God. First he said, First he said, don't go far. And then he said, just the men. And then he said, no livestock. And I'm sure under his breath he said, mine are all dead, I kind of need yours. Right? But he was setting the terms. He was bargaining with God. I wish I could say that I don't bargain with God. But I can't count how many times I've said, when I know God is speaking to me and loves something from me, I can't tell you how many times I've said, like, well, look how far I've come already. Or, look at me compared to so-and-so. Or, but I've given up so much. Or how about, I know you really want me to change this right now, but how about if I keep this for a little while and I'll give you a little more over here. How about this one? You hear this all the time. I'm not quite ready. I'm not quite ready. 
a recipe for disaster. There is so much worse. How about that one? There's so much worse I could be doing. Or how about these two? These might be the saddest ones of all, and I can tell you I've used these. But I know God uses all things for good. Or how about this? I know God's going to forgive me. He says so in his word. We're bargaining with God. It's just a matter of time before destruction comes, before heartache comes. Um, yeah, so I kind of skipped, I missed a couple of things here, but um, these are things that I saw in Pharaoh, and I definitely, definitely see in YouTube. And we're going to talk about the fixes later, but first of all, we're going to watch um, how this worked out for Pharaoh. How this played out in his life. How his shallow sorrow and his misguided motivation and his bargain dealing with God worked out for him. And uh, hopefully I'll be back up here and we can talk about the fixes. How we can go about making sure that we don't fall into these same traps that Pharaoh has. Is everyone ready? Are the cast and the, are the important people ready? Sorry. <laughs> I don't take that personally. <laughs> Stephen Greenaway, are you ready? You do. Are you guys ready? Let's rock this town. All right. Okay, action.
Clap again. Let's follow. No, oh, I'm bored. Where is my need? Stop complaining. <laughs> this this won't take longer than 40 days. It's okay, guys. I'll make a golden cat. <laughs> Pharaoh, we can see. 
my needs. Stop complaining. <laughs> this this won't take longer than 40 days. It's okay, guys. I'll make a golden cat. <laughs> <laughs>